morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second day of the 8th Delphi Economic Forum. Today we'll start uh, our program with a very hopefully interesting discussion regarding the NPLs and the secondary market. Uh, the title is Refinancing Opportunities and Challenging. And uh, I am the uh, manager of CNN Greece, I'm Dimitris Pefanis, and I have a very uh, high level panel of people who are, have actually billions under management, I have thorough knowledge on the NPL market. So let us welcome uh, Mrs. Fotiniu Anu, the general manager of the Legacy and Portfolio Specialized Asset Solutions Unit at NBG Greece. Uh, Mr. John Papa Evangelou, the CEO of Relational Greece. Mr. Theophilos Kostandinidis, the director of Hellenic Finance Limited Greece. And Mr. Ewan Robinson, partner at Oliver Wyman. For the next 29 minutes, we'll be discussing NPLs, of course, the secondary market, the challenges, and the opportunities that have arisen in the last uh, couple of years. And hopefully, we'll come to uh, some fruitful conclusion regarding the next steps and how all involved partners can face and tackle the challenges. So, starting right off the bat with Mrs. Ioannou, um, you represent the banks at our panel. So, what is the role that the banks can play in the secondary market of NPLs? Okay, thank you, Dimitri. Thank you for the invite. It's a heavy subject to kick off the day, but well, we'll do our best. Um, before answering that question about the role of the banks and um, in the secondary market of the NPLs, I think it's important just to set the stage and remind everyone of the difference in the current environment um, in relation to the last four or five years. Um, at the moment, all four systemic banks have single-digit MP ratios, and in the past four or five years, uh, we have all offloaded um, something like 100 billion worth of MPEs. Um, um, through, to a large extent, uh, securitizations, portfolio sales, but also through um, organic actions such as restructurings. And thankfully, the narrative on Greek banks has shifted away from NPE cleanup to sustainable growth and business model resilience. Now, going to the secondary market, what is also true is that the MPs may have left the banks, but they're still in the system. They're in the hands of the investors and are being managed uh, by the servicers. And the business plans that, ha that are attached to the sales and the securitizations that took place are very demanding. And the achievement of the targets of those business plans will only, um, will only come around if um, uh, the servicers and the investors are successful in truly working out uh, the non-performing exposures, which is something that has recently um, started. Um, now, the achievement of those uh, business plan targets can happen through basically a number of recovery strategies. It can happen through follow-on sales, which is the secondary market or part of the secondary market, and that's a market that I think is going to be uh, very, very relevant in the next um, 18 to 24 months. It's started already, but I think we will see a lot more activity in the next 18, 24 months. Or they can recover, um, uh, they can meet their recovery targets through monetization of the asset or through rehabilitation of the debtor. Let me make a parenthesis because monetization of the asset leads to the you know, ugly word of auctions. And, and we've had a lot of discussions about auctions. And I think whether we like it or not, for an efficient banking system, for an efficient credit system, you need to have a liquid efficient auction market. Um, it's, it's a fact of life, it's a necessity. What is also true, and I think it's important to be noted, is that more than three quarters of the recoveries that are expected to come through those business plans are not expected to come through auctions. They're expected to come through amicable solutions. And I think this is a very important note to, um, to make. Um, now, the role that the banks can play in the secondary market. Obviously, we can um, finance the secondary portfolio transactions through senior financing. We can provide working capital facilities so that the investors um, can onboard and mature the assets through the LGs and the Rioco financings. We can provide financings to the third party buyers of the assets. But the most important role that the banks can play um, is by helping to shape the framework that um, will provide the debtors that will have been viably restructured to, with a second chance to return to the banking system. And I think that's where we can play a pivotal role. And I think we will have an opportunity to talk about that more in the next part of the discussion. 
You're right on point, and thank you for setting up the stage and facilitating the discussion for the rest of us. So I'd like to move on to Mr. Papayvieniu. We live in an age of technology, we live in an age of AI, we are discussing all these things. So how can you define opportunities and challenges in the sector through technology? Okay, uh, as a technology company, uh, now we are operating through our customers in more than 20 countries all over the world. So we have the experience of different markets and different verticals uh, in uh, different spaces. <clears throat> to us, there are four very important pillars uh, to make it happen. The first one is talented people, because you need to have the talent to uh, define the models and uh, the solutions that are uh, relevant to your job and your uh, effort to uh, apply to the secondary markets uh, your vision. Uh, the third one is the systems, and the, th the fourth one is the data. Uh, the data is one of the most important pillars, and this is something that uh, many uh, companies, investors, funds, banks, or services are suffering from because, you know, uh, especially moving the data uh, from one place to the other and from different systems to the others, you see a lot of discrepancies you see a lot of problems and you, you see a lot of issues that are coming up. So the models are not performing very well. Uh, the solutions are not uh, presenting the right results. So there is a very big hurdle uh, in this situation. And this is something that you have to take care of before uh, you uh, enter all this uh, data to the final systems to take decisions. Uh, there are quite many solutions. Uh, that we can apply in those different areas, like uh, simulating the data, uh, uh, cleansing the data, and do all, all the proper work that is required for, uh, for them to be done. Uh, and of course, the very last days in, uh, in the uh, previous uh, uh, forums uh, uh, yesterday, there was a lot of discussions about the AI. Is the AI helpful? Uh, can AI solve the issues? Uh, of course, to me, the AI is going to be a very good butler, a data butler. It's going to help uh, the uh, organizations to perform better. But uh, we have to be very skeptical if the AI becomes the master of the game, and then we are going to lose uh, the ability to perform as we wish, because the machines are going to take it over. And as a very uh, famous professor from uh, Oxford, uh, Nick Bostrom, said, we have to be prepared for that. And before we go to the extended AI procedures, we have to regulate properly. Thank you very much. And moving from AI to ancient Greek mythology, let us talk about Hercules. Also, a Hercules asset protection team. We have the spiritual father of a Hercules at our audience. So moving on to Mr. Konstantinidis. Uh, do you believe that the, uh, perhaps the Hercules Asset Protection Team vehicles uh, are lagging in regards to the rated business plan recovery projections? And if yes, and that's up, up to you to ask, answer, what can they do about it? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to the forum. Um, well, there are, more, there are around 15 HAP securitization vehicles, so um, some, many of them are doing fine. Uh, the ones that uh, are having difficulties uh, living up to the rated plan projections, um, we in Hellenic Finance, as a top advisor on the, on the secondary sales side, have had the privilege to actually look some of these business plans uh, in detail. And we've identified three areas as the main culprits um, that, for some of these business plans. And the main culprits actually are systemic, regulatory, and structural problems of the Greek uh, bank financing market. They actually don't relate to the ability of these servicers to do their job in recovering. They relate to the ability of the borrowers and the buyers of the various assets to have the necessary funding they need uh, in order to settle their debts. And let, let me be more specific. Um, in, you know, one of the biggest areas is uh, reperforming loans. Uh, if the business plans with some of these HAPs relied on taking the reperforming loans and selling them back to the Greek banking system, which is, by the way, the natural owner of a 15-year Uriber plus 2% loan is not some private equity fund, is not a HAPS vehicle, uh, is a Greek bank balance sheet. They're the ones that get the best return on equity for that, such a loan, 
and they have the, the deposits to finance it. So, but the, the, uh, the Greek banking system being funded by the government in the bailout uh, is still very restricted from SRT, from EBA rules, and only a small portion of these reperforming loans, loans that have been reperforming for two years, three years or more, uh, can find their way back to the banking system uh, because of the regulatory restrictions. Um, on the other hand, you have business plans that also have a large portion, um, as Fotini mentioned, of amicable settlements. Now, how does amicable settlement happen? You know, let's say I have a $200,000 loan, a euro loan, and I have a 100,000 euro property, uh, an apartment, collateralizing it. I can't afford to pay it. Uh, the servicer comes and says, listen, I'm only going to get 70,000 from an auction here. Why don't you give me 70,000 and I forgive 130,000 of the debt? Uh, I have 10,000. I need to go somewhere to borrow 60,000. Who's going to lend me? Um, the banks that can touch me um, are very limited, very small. Uh, and some of the credit departments in these banks won't be able, you know, I'm still blacklisted, won't be able to give me a loan. So, you know, we need alternatives uh, to this. Uh, we need uh, the, if you like, the, all the stakeholders that are involved in this business, uh, from the MinFIN, the Bank of Greece, the servicers, the banks, um, the HAPS vehicles, uh, to get together to see how do we resolve this uh, issue. And there are tools there to do it. Um, and, you know, the last area is uh, e-auctions, you mentioned. Well, in e-auctions, I'd love to buy property in e-auction, but no bank will give me any funding because I don't have the documents. And I only get the documents after I buy the property. Uh, I don't have planning. I don't have the planning permissions. Yeah, the very limited information. So how would anybody finance me to purchase a property uh, on any auction? So these are some of the issues uh, that are affecting these business plans. And um, you know, there, there are ways around it. Um, and we need to use some of the financial tools that are available out there uh, to do it. Thank you very much. And let us move a little bit away from Greece. So moving on to Mr. Robertson. NPLs and NPE issues are not a uniquely Greek matter. So given your global experience, in what ways is the Greek market different from other counterparts? And are there any lessons learned from other markets that we can use to our benefit? Thanks a lot for the question and, of course, for the invite to the panel, which is a great pleasure, even at this time in the morning. Um, as Fortuny sort of laid out in, in her introduction, the MPL stock in Greece is still extremely large. The banks have sold a lot of the assets, so we have a lot less focus on it now, in a way, and it's not the subject of all panels at Delphi anymore, uh, but it's still a very huge stock and uh, many loans have to fight the right home for their workouts and the, the right solutions, hence the subject of our, our debate this morning. Um, if you compare that to how things have worked out in, in other countries, I think it's useful to look at sort of Spain and Ireland and hopefully not so much at Italy, where things are not so far further ahead and perhaps the picture doesn't look as positive. But if you look at Spain and Ireland, you'd say that it, it's been quite a positive story. They actually followed the same strategy that has been followed in Greece, they got all the assets off the bank balance sheets, and, and the workout has been relatively successful. Not everybody makes money, as we just uh, you know, heard in terms of the success of business plans. And of course, there are many changes that need to be made about uh, legislative framework along the way and many solutions that need to be found. But the fact is that property prices have not uh, fallen horrendously. The economies have recovered. And that's a positive view for Greece going forwards because we actually have still a huge overhang of all these things to work out. And so we hope that the same story plays out in Greece. I guess the big question for Greece is really how much of that was because of the strategy that was followed, moving things to investors' balance sheets and allowing them to work out the problem, and how much was it about the financial conditions? Now we have much higher rates than we have done for a very long time. We have a cost of living crisis. We have a situation in which debtors are struggling and the financial returns for the investors are going to be a lot more squeezed. So they'll obviously have to act more quickly and this will weigh on the borrowers and weigh on their ability to, to, to recover things. So it's more of an open question than a conclusion in a way, but the comparison to other countries might lead you to believe that things will work out very well, but I think the situation is becoming quite different. Uh, at the moment, of course, it feels like that hasn't really changed things so radically in the Greek market. We don't see uh, very large signs of additional distress from Greek debtors yet. I'm a risk professional, so my uh, hunch is to say that things will get worse. Um, but, but I hope to be optimistic as well, of course. 
Um, so anyway, we have to watch and wait on, on, on that one. But I suppose the optimistic view is at least with the situation that we have now, as, as in those other countries, if things do turn for the worse, whilst it's a, you know, it's a problem in terms of the individual debtors' outcomes, it's less of a problem for the system, which is a positive view. Thank you very much, uh, Yuan, and hopefully it will not turn to the much worse. So let's get back to Mrs. Uh, Ioano and move on to the banks once again. So what is the role that you as banks, of course, can play for re-performing debtors? What are the tools, what are the opportunities that you offer? I'm actually going to agree with uh, Theo uh, quite a bit, which doesn't happen often, but uh, I'm going to agree here. Um, as, I, uh, as I said before, it is true that by our nature, the banks have a very important role to play um, in shaping the framework and providing the solutions together with the other players in the market, the investors, the servicers, the regulator, obviously very, very important for a second chance for cooperative debtors. And it is true that the banks are uniquely placed to re-onboard those loans uh, that will be restructured by the servicers and will have proven their performing status to one extent or another. And it is true that the natural owners of long-term restructurings with reasonable LTVs um, are the banks. It's not the investors that have invested in the distressed um, situations in the first place. The RPL securitization market is very, very active in, uh, in the UK and Ireland. And I truly believe that it's going to be very relevant in Greece as well. And to be honest, it's not rocket science. I mean, we at NBG have been offering viable restructurings I think we're still the only bank that offers the split and settle product, which basically does that. You know, it creates viable restructurings, it um, creates loans that have reasonable LTVs and allows for equity upside to the mortgage holder. And this is what the services are going to be doing. And if they're going to be doing that, then obviously the banks have every reason to buy those assets. And obviously, all this needs to be done in a very careful and regulatory compliant manner. And we need to work together with the servicers to um, make sure that they provide the right solutions. And most importantly, to go to what um, John, John said, to have the right data that we will need in order to re-onboard those loans as truly performing. Um, now, and to talk about NBG in particular, this is a strategic priority for us. The re-intermediation of those assets back onto the banking balance sheets you know, in a country where we've had 50% NPE ratio and two or three years of growth so far, we're still at something like 55% performing assets as percent to GDP. It's obvious that there is an opportunity there. So for us, it's a strategic priority to create an end-to-end -end collaboration framework, a nexus between all the players, the investors, the banks, the regulator, in order to provide this second chance framework. And in fact, we're going a step even further. We're not just financiers. At the moment, we're in exclusive discussions with one of the biggest players in the market, with Fortress, to create a joint venture to provide what you said, Theo, to provide DPO financings and refinancing opportunities to mortgage holders and asset-backed SME holders. So, you know, very important, and I think no, you know, this NPL secondary market can only work if the banks play a pivotal role. Thank you very much for that, and I totally agree that the the banks are the biggest player and the, the, the movers and takers in the sector. Uh, let's move on to technology and once again, uh, Mr. Pavaginio, you said that AI cannot and should not be the master of the game, but who will be the master of the game and what is your proposed solution that covers the anticipated demands of refinancing? Uh, the master of the game is always the human uh, mind, uh, the talent of uh, the humans. Uh, the humans are creating the strategies, the models, the methods and all the stuff. Uh, even the AI is going to be uh, get a lot of the human knowledge, and subsequently uh, it's going to add to this knowledge uh, its own expertise through the data uh, crunching over the day. So uh, let's imagine that uh, a service is, is getting a portfolio from somebody. Uh, in this portfolio, there are many cases uh, where we have. Uh, uh, different types of loans with different tenures, different profiles. And what this means is that uh, in this portfolio there are many broken promises. Uh, who's going to be the guy who's going to ask uh, 
for help to, to, to refinance things. Uh, the help is going to come from the systems. Okay? Uh, and the systems are going to segment properly the portfolio in different classes, families, uh, in order to give us the ability to select the proper uh, bucket to work with. And as soon as we select the bucket, then we have to simulate. And we have to see uh, what's going to be one scenario or the second scenario or the third scenario, the best one. And if this is working, uh, we can proceed. If it's not, we have to stop and go to other methods of restructuring the loan or uh, going to defaults and all the stuff. So the technology is there. Uh, the technology can offer significant tools uh, to help the uh, decision makers to go forward. Uh, refinancing is not an easy task because we have already a, pro a broken promise uh, that is actually uh, a problematic relationship. So we have to see uh, the assets, we have to see the person, we have to see the regulator, we have to see the moment and define properly what's going to be our strategy. And a system uh, cannot uh, do it by itself. Uh, an individual, uh, a human talented person is going to decide of that, is going to promote new methods, uh, new incentives uh, in uh, the financiers and the debtors to work together and go forward. And I'm really happy to hear that. So hopefully in a few years we'll be still able to be talking about NPLs among ourselves rather than talking to other machines. NPLs is a reality, you know, and it's happening for many, many years. We cannot avoid it. And moving to Mr. Konsanidis, I guess you're getting all the rough questions at the panel. Uh, and we have the once again discussing uh, Hercules attic protection schemes. Do you think that these vehicles are being forced to fire sale their MPLs to keep up with their ready business plan recovery target, or is it business as usual? Well, uh, we will never advise uh, anybody to do a fire sale. That's a total destruction of value, and uh, the, we haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, but let's, let's put the things in perspective. Uh, we, you, there's this perception that you know, we're clear of the MPL problem in Greece. Uh, we're not. We have more than a million people in Greece affected uh, by being uh, you know, in the red, um, uh, either directly or you know, through a family association. One in five properties have some sort of lien on it. Um, these, all these people are stuck in financial no man's land. On the other side, the banks have tons of liquidity and nobody to lend money to. Now, a large portion of what's right now non-performing borrowers can be very well be become performing borrowers of much smaller amounts of debt uh, with good collaterals and so forth. So the, the key question for us in Greece is how do we channel all this liquidity that the banks have uh, through the regulatory restrictions and, all, uh, and, uh, and the financial system to that portion of those borrowers that can afford to pay their loans. So we identified two areas. Uh, Fodini said uh, the re-performing re loan book. These people have been performing. These are good debtors. But the restrictions are such that the banks cannot touch directly these loans. But there are tools like securitizations. We, we in uh, Hellenic Finance have been just been mandated to do a proof of concept of an unrated securitization of re-performing loans for one of the HAPS vehicles. And the idea there is that the bank will be able to buy 80% um, of, you know, of that capital structure. The HAPS retain the 20% close to par, close to parity. Um, the PAC will have much better protection than it would under the, the direct purchase of the loans, better risk rating, and better return on equity. So these tools have been tested all across Europe. The biggest bank in Europe use these tools every day. Greek banks use these tools, but not for our PLs. So we think um, focusing the regulator, focusing the banks, the stakeholders, using the existing tools that are existing in the European financial system, been approved by the European Central Bank, and, and moving them into areas like our PLs would be a solution. Um, just to add uh, uh, one more thing to that, um, in the areas, the other big area is mortgage refinancing. Um, you know, the how, your apartment, your house is one of the biggest assets any Greek family has. And uh, I, there's an enormous amount of these things right now stuck in, in bad loans. And people want to buy back their loans, but they have no funding to do so. Uh, they want to buy back their properties, they have no funding to do so. We have been for a year now working with all the stakeholders um, 
and we have even proposed some changes to legislation to enable uh, servicers uh, to uh, servicing licenses that actually a lot of them are not even used, being used right now, they're, they're dormant, to be uh, repositioned to become non-bank uh, uh, financing platforms, refinancing platforms targeted at mortgage refinancing. And I think we're making good progress there. Uh, you know, the bank Greece and the regulator and, and the MinFin are, are working on, on, on solutions there. Uh, and I would second what Fotini said, the stakeholders need to get together around the table. Uh, it's everybody's problem. Uh, I, you know, getting, getting the, uh, such a large part of the Greek economy out of no man financial land and getting them to be an active part and a producing part of the economy, again, is, is critical to, to the Greek economic future. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Robertson, one question for you. Um, Theo and for, uh, just said and Fotini just mentioned beforehand that the stakeholders, we need to sit together at the table. So how can third parties, such as yourselves, facilitate the process of uh, refinancing and streamlining the market? And what is your role uh, in solving the equation? If the previous question was a tough question, then my question is a very kind question. You just ask an advisor, what role can you play in this whole process? And I, I obviously I have a list of, of roles we can play in the, in the process. Um, so th this re-performing market, or the, the idea of uh, redistributing the re-performing loans back to the bank balance sheet, I think it's been the, the real hit of the morning on the panel. And like everyone else, I agree that obviously the logical home for these loans must be on bank balance sheets. It's, destructive to investors' business plans for them to remain there. And as a result, it doesn't incentivize the right sort of solutions if it's not possible. So we obviously you know, see, the, see the imperative to, to make that market work. At the same time, we should, you know, we should all recognize there are a lot of risks around those loans. There was a lot of effort put into getting those loans off the bank balance sheets not very long ago. And so obviously it's a career ending mistake from a regulator or supervisory perspective to allow them back onto the balance sheet and then see the same problems resurface uh, as we go into a potentially what could be a new downturn. So we have to have some sympathy for, for some uh, conservatism over that. Uh, and, and we remember what's happened to those loans as they've been restructured and they've been restructured to make their debt burden viable, but, but obviously they weren't restructured to leave a lot of space, you know. So uh, that means as interest rates rise, as inflation hits, um, then these, these loans will be in a more questionable place. So, so one key, key question, one, one key answer to your question is, you know, what can we do is that there's, there is work to be done, I think, on assessing the risks that banks would take back on in those re-performing loan transactions and in reassuring and you know, understanding what the implications of those would be and, uh, and thinking through the regulatory perspective and, and how it interacts with processes like the significant risk transfer agreements that were made at the point when those securitizations were made. So I think there's a, there's a significant amount of risk assessment that needs to be done in order to reach the solution that we all think is, is the viable one. And then in the, broader, <clears throat> in the broader discussion, we, I think, have also touched on the wider elements of the secondary market. Uh, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a spate of transactions that's going on and will continue to go on because very large securitizations were done and then particular, particular pockets of loans will have to find their right home in the financial system. It's not always the case that the one servicer is the right place and the one investor is the right investor to work out particular loans. So, for example, we'll see, as we've seen already some, we'll see more sector-specific deals and, uh, and, and deals with particular restructuring stories in mind. And I think that's another role for, for advisors like ourselves is in terms of you know, putting together the business plans and painting the future for those companies and groups of companies. And, and of course, there are still big questions around you know, the operating models to service these things. Uh, the most efficient delivery of workout solutions and so on that have also been touched on uh, this morning. But so plenty of, plenty of work to do, I think. Thank you very much, Ivan, and thank you very much. It was a really fruitful discussion. From my part, I think we have gone a really long way towards solving the NPL problem. Uh, deep down in my heart, I really hope that Ewan is wrong and uh, we're not at next, when we have this next, discussion next year, we're at a better position rather than a worse position. And once again, thank you very much, all of you, for attending. Thank you.